about Silicon Sisters? Silicon, well, first of all, don't I look like someone that would own a video game company? Right? <laughs> no? It's the shoes, right? No. So weird that I own a video game company, right? Weird that I'm in video games, really. I mean, video games, there's not a lot of 46-year-old women, really, running video game companies or even involved in the industry. It's about 80 to 90 percent male. So it's a bit odd. And what's, what's also odd is that um, I'm a social worker, right? For 15 years of my life, I really focused on helping children from violent homes and working with women uh, who were leading domestic violence. I worked a lot in the sexual assault movement. And that's kind of where my heart lays. I'm, I'm kind of a do-gooder sort of girl. But things changed for me, and I needed to find an occupation that was going to pay a lot more. I got divorced, and I, I didn't want my kids to you know, not be able to continue riding and doing Taekwondo and all that cool stuff they were doing. And social workers don't make a ton of money. I mean, even though I had done my MBA and I was running nonprofits, I really needed something more. I wanted to give my kids more than that. So I did a survey of what was going on in Vancouver. And video games were a great opportunity. There's a, a ton. In 2004, there were a ton of really cool old studios doing really neat things. And I thought, wow, that's a place I want to be. So I jumped in. And what's been really interesting to me is that the, I'm going to share with you some information about why I think games are good for kids, right? Are you guys all with me? Games are good for kids. <laughs> Not so much, right? <laughs> I got a lot of skeptics. I get that. I get that. And, and the way that I came to this understanding is that I needed to reconcile my own personal choices, which were, you know, here I am, I've devoted my life to trying to make the world a better place, and now I'm going to own and run a video game studio. What? Right? How does that work? And so the whole time that I've been involved in games, I've asked myself, is this the right thing for me? Are these a positive contribution? And am I doing the right thing for my kids? My kids are now 22, 20, and 17, all off at school. So I've done a ton of research into this area, primarily just so I could feel comfortable or choose to leave the industry that I've chosen to be in. And I want to introduce you to an amazing researcher. Now, the first thing that you should do when you leave this conference, after you go download that amazing song we just heard, is go to TED Talks and look up a woman named Jane McGonigal. Jane McGonigal is phenomenal. She's incredible. She's done two TED Talks. She's written a book called Reality is Broken and Game Designers Can Fix It, New York Times bestseller. And basically what she's done is she's looked at the power of games and how we're only now starting to understand how we can harness games and use them for good, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of her findings. So this, this wonderful picture is uh, the first one of Jane's findings. Jane looked at 10,040 people and asked them, okay, you guys are serious gamers. What is it that you get out of games? Why are you so devoted to games? Like, you would spend all your time, don't your kids spend all their time, you would spend all your time playing games. Why? What are the 10 top emotions that you experience when you're gaming? Here's the top 10. 10, joy. Relief. How about love? And this one was interesting. I read really carefully on this one because I would also call it altruism, the sense of wanting to do well for others. Okay. Surprise. Let me do this. <laughs> Pride. I rocked that game. I'm the best, right? That sense of just being amazing at it. Curiosity. Excitement, awe and wonder, contentment, just feeling really kind of happy, just kind of happy, and creativity. How about that? I mean, those 10 things, I think I want my kids to feel those 10 things, right? Those are good things. And what's really interesting about the creativity finding is that there's so much research into games, and you'll find pockets here and pockets there, and they conflict each other, and it's really hard to muddle through. What I can say to you with great confidence is this piece has been proven and proven and proven and proven. And there was recently a study at the University of Michigan where they looked at 460 kids. And what they did, this is really interesting, they got the kids to identify what technologies they were involved in. So what were they gaming? What did they have? Did they have a cell phone? How much did they play? What did they play? They looked at all of that involvement in technology. And then they overlapped it with a, a very... Um, well-accepted creativity test. 
And they found, once they'd isolated for other factors, that definitively, children who play video games are more creative, period, full stop. That test has been done again and again. It's true. So what about this part? <laughs> what about the aggression, right? What do we know about that? And there's a lot of research on this now. When I first started, the research wasn't very mm, conclusive in one direction or the other, but we're, we're actually getting much closer to a real body of knowledge now. So we see this kind of stuff. I mean, GTA 5 came out this week, right? There, there's a lot of violent games out there, and what I would say to you about this is, when you're choosing a movie for your child, would you choose, I don't know, Goodfellas, right? Are you gonna bring home Kill Bill? You don't, don't do that, right? <laughs> we don't do that. Why do we allow equally violent video games in our home for children? Why do we allow, don't allow that, right? That's just not on, it's just not on. Didn't do it with my kids, don't recommend doing it with yours. Choose appropriately. There's a ton of beautiful, creative, amazing, engaging games out there, right? We have to be responsible for choosing them. So that's my little, that's not research, that's opinion, but there it is. Because uh, I don't think it's true, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't think it's true that video games cause violence. I don't. There is one exception to that that I'll tell you about. But this stuff has not been proven out. What we do know, though, is that people who do 18 hours of one thing, 18 hours of playing violent video games, these are not well people, right? So there is a relationship, for sure, but I'm not sure it's causal. But let's take a look at what we do know. So what we do know. When children are gaming, especially in a multiplayer environment, so with other people gaming, if they play a violent game, so not even children, adults, people, everyone, if they play a violent game with their friends and with their family, there is no RL effect, no real life affect after they play the game, none, okay? They do not become more aggressive, all right? However, and this piece is important, if someone is playing a violent game online with people they don't know, anonymously, there is real life effect. The aggression does carry over. That's the only piece that I could find for certain has been proven out in regards to violence in games. Worth knowing. What's really interesting, though, is the opposite proves out really consistently, which is when you are socially engaged in a game, when you're playing with other people online, when you're doing altruistic things, when you're working together to try and whatever the goal is, you know, create a new kingdom, uh, build a world, uh, solve an environmental crisis, whatever that altruistic goal is that you're doing socially online, those feelings of altruism, that sense of wanting to do well in the world towards other people does carry over. It does carry over. We've also found the last couple of years, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some really interesting research that I've come across because I think it's the direction that we can be going with games and the direction that I hope we go with games. There was a study recently that showed that when children are in hospital waiting for surgery, they have tremendous anxiety. And what they've been doing, what they've been testing, is allowing children to play handheld video games while they're waiting for surgery. And they have found that they're tremendously successful in reducing anxiety. What's also interesting is that video games can reduce the sense of pain equally to painkillers, equally or more effectively than painkillers. That's amazing, right? That's a phenomenal finding, and how wonderful for kids in the hospital that we can provide this for them. There's also been some research coming out of um, the Surgeon General in the US, where they have used video games in Afghanistan with soldiers, and they've found that if soldiers game for three to four hours a day, it reduces their stress level by 75%. That's extraordinary. When we have the challenges that we have right now with PTSD of people in Afghanistan, this is a very, very significant finding. We've also found that video games can have an incredible impact on uh, decreasing depression, and that's being investigated right now. So this is my particular area, right? Girls gaming. Girls don't game as much as boys. It makes me crazy. Why is that, right? Why is that? I've been gaming for 35 years. 
I grew up in Nanaimo, a small town girl, started gaming at 11. Pong, right? I was the asteroids champion of Vancouver Island when I was 13 years old. It's true. It's true. <laughs> but what happened? What happened? Like, why? The fun that I had, I loved, I loved space as a kid, and the fun that I had playing games, that all went away for me. Why did that leave? Why did, why did I stop being a gamer? Because games became about shooters. Games became a very, in my opinion, male agenda, right? All the games that I was enjoying so much, you know, the Pac-Man and the Space Invaders and all that great stuff, they just kind of went by the wayside and we became very fixated on sports, on racing, on shooting. And it's not surprising when you look at the makeup of who's in the games industry. As I said, it's 80 to 90% male. So the focus of the content shifted on us. Well, that's starting to change. Our company's trying to change it, and there are many other companies trying to change it, which is really exciting. Now, another piece of research I want to leave you with. The University of Alberta, three years ago, came out with some very interesting research that showed this. When you look at who enters technology, there is a relationship to their history in gaming. So said a different way, kids that game are far more likely to enter tech fields, okay? Boys game. Girls don't. Is that okay that we only have guys entering tech fields? It's not okay with me. The world I live in is becoming more and more technological all the time. And so I would argue, and certainly I've tried to make this point with my own daughter, and with the quality of games that we build, we build games for girls that are very high quality and very engaging with positive images and so on, it's really important that girls game because they need to feel comfortable with technology. They need to feel engaged with where our world is going. And we have the power, through games, to make incredible changes. Thank you very much.